The Multimedia Ninja Podcast, Episode 55, Our Trip to Cuba. Hello again and welcome to The Multimedia Ninja Podcast, where it's all about surviving and thriving in the digital convergence. My name is Bradford Rogers and I'll be interviewing some multimedia ninjas who are making things happen in their respective fields and sharing tips, tools, and insights for multimedia artists and content creators. As always, you can find show notes at themultimedianinja.com. This week, our trip to La República de Cuba. Care for a cigar? As you may know, in this podcast series, my friends and I will be talking about all things multimedia, including creativity, shaping your ideas, and how to be more productive doing it, regardless of what kind of content you're creating. We have got an exciting episode for you today, so what do you say we just let's get to it? To it. To it. To it. To it. TMN 055, take six. Hey there, did you miss me? It is great to be back, and it is great to be busy. Very awesome. I just got back from Cuba, of course, and we've got a whole show on that. And I am hopping right back into the fray. I am working on my father's second book. Actually, he's working on it. I'm just uh, kicking his a little bit. (laughs) Uh, If you want to see his first book, by the way, Depression Baby, which is not about depression, you can go to depressionbaby.com and get either a Kindle or a hardcover or a signed hardcover of that. Also, I have got a, a CD layout project coming on for a friend of mine. Of course, I am working on the continuing project with Mr. Timothy P. Green. In particular, this week, I've been working on his website, which had an issue. You could previously, and you can now, again, go to timothypgreen.net to get a free download of the title track from his record that I happened to produce called birds had flown very proud of that record extremely proud it is awesome uh i don't say that because i'm producing it but because timothy's material is really cool it will make you tap your toes and it is doing so in a way that you will probably not be familiar with because it's not like all the other stuff out there if you've already got it my pardons but You can go again, once again, to timothypgreen.net and get the free download, which you could not do a week or so ago because we realized that the page was not working. And suffice to say that issue is solved. But Cuba, 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 Cuba. Maybe I'll just have a little cigar here. Hmm, that is a fine cigar. Cohiba. We will be getting to Cuba in just a moment, including some travel tips you need to know whether you're sailing or flying in. But before we get to that, let's just briefly drop in on our segment, Winners and Losers. Our first winners for the week are Melissa and Chris. Winner. Well, Melissa is one of my fellow Recording Academy members, and Chris is her significant other. Not a bad guy for an attorney type, and quite the cyclist. What's very interesting is they've been watching the podcast, and they decided to use the application or the online software as a service called Slack that we talked about in a previous episode, which is an email replacement sort of thing to communicate with your team, they decided to use it in their home, which I think is pretty awesome. So give it up for Melissa and Chris. Winner! I I envy and admire you guys for doing that. Secondly, I need to give props to another winner this week, the Hemingway International Yacht Club. Winner! And in particular... 
Isabel there who went above and beyond. We'll have more on the Hemingway Yacht Club and Cuba and Havana and things like that a little bit later. Our loser of the week is me. Loser. Thank you. I say that because I have lost 30 pounds from my fitness program. I actually lost 45 pounds down to 187 at one point, but now I'm on the hypertrophy or hypertrophy part of the program from the new rules of lifting uh, routine. It's a very awesome program. I get no money from them, but I found their guidance to be common sense and very helpful. That's the new rules of lifting. I'll try and put a link to it. I am now lifting per workout more pounds in total than our sailing vessel JC Sails weighs, which is nine tons or 18,000 pounds. Thank you. I'm actually up to over 20,000 pounds total per workout. Winner! But speaking of boats, did I mention I sailed to Cuba and back? If you've been following on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or in real life, you'll know I've been sailing the Gulf Coast in the Keys for the last four years aboard JC Sails, a cutter-rigged sailboat. And I've been building up gradually, making about a dozen longer cruises in that time and a number of day sails. I've now done over 3,000, probably closer to 4,000 nautical miles. Over 2,000 of those miles have been solo and over 1,000 were offshore, by which I mean more than 12 miles. But I had never sailed to another country. Thankfully, I've got a partner that enjoys sailing with me and I haven't killed her yet, so she still trusts me. That would be Tanya, but we call her the Admiral. And the Admiral, for some crazy reason, liked my idea about sailing to Cuba. In fact, we were going to go last year at New Year's, but we couldn't figure out what damn papers and permits we needed. Well, just to deliver some important info for cruisers, here's what an American captain needs in order to sail from the U.S. to Cuba and back. As a captain, you'll need a passport worthy of a multimedia ninja. Everybody needs a passport. A visa, and if you're sailing, you get it at customs at the marina upon arrival. You'll need a U.S. Coast Guard Form 3300 permission to enter Cuban territorial waters. You'll need your ship's papers, a $25 DTOPS, D-T-O-P-S, customs decal, an eligible reason for going, that is, you can't theoretically just go for tourism, and certain vaccinations are recommended but not required. Now, that's the simple version. I'll save you some of the details for later, and you will want those. If you stay no more than 14 days, you can avoid some extra hoops with the U.S. government. Of course, if you're going there just as a crew member, all you really need is a passport, a visa, your vaccinations if you desire, and a legit reason to be there. I'll tell you this, they're much more laid back on the Cuban side in my experience. Just don't bring any drugs or contraband and don't f*** up and you should be good to go. So anyway, we finally figured out what we needed thanks to Linus from the Slow Boat to Cuba podcast and Captain Cheryl Barr's cruising guide and Tanya booked a one-way flight to Key West. I really wanted to go full ninja on this trip, documenting everything from a zillion angles like Matrix bullet time or something and bringing every piece of video, photo, and audio gear that I had. But as it got closer to time to depart, I finally realized that 
It might just be best if I focus on getting us from point A to point B and back in one piece. The whole thing of getting these permits and decals and vaccinations and making sure the boat was ready to cross the Gulf Stream with minimal prep time was starting to weigh on me a little and I finally decided it was just time to go. I'd take a reasonable rig, focus on sailing the boat, and get to Cuba and back with the crew in one piece. But since this is the Multimedia Ninja podcast, I will just mention the one piece of gear I most wish I had brought and did not, and that is my Edelkrone Flex Tilt Head. It's great both on the tripod and as a standalone stand for your camera, but more on that for another time. I am waiting actually on a little piece of hardware, a 3 8 baby pin stud, so I can mount this with a clamp wherever I need it. But very handy little gadget, folds into like just a little wafer. Very nice. At any rate, after the usual Christmas festivities and travels, I packed up and I drove from Atlanta down to St. Pete on December 26th, arriving late at night as usual, and I found the boat still afloat, which is always a good thing. I found my marina neighbor, Peter Suarez, aboard, and we may or may not have had a beverage once I got all the gear aboard. If you're not familiar with Peter from some of my traveling ninja posts on the YouTube channel, he is one talented hombre. Yes, Peter wrote that tune and has a really amazing one-man show called Chameleon that I'll have to link to in the show notes. I had to leave on the 28th to meet the Admiral in Key West, so that left only one day to get provisioned and get money changed, which as it turns out was largely a waste of time. I may elaborate later, but suffice to say changing US dollars to Canadian dollars to change to Cuban pesos may not be necessary. My friend Harbor Master Dennis was kind enough to lend me his pressure washer to uh, help wash off the bird so we'd look respectable, and on the 28th, the mad dash began. Well, almost. It seems that a certain boatyard, when they installed tricolor running lights at the top of the mast, removed the deck level running lights from the breaker panel. Oh. I was very proud to be able to reattach the bow lights myself, but when I went to hook up a proper stern light, I mistakenly cut the wire from our solar panel that charges the batteries when we're underway. Loser. Oops. But I got that spliced and we were finally underway by late afternoon in time to catch the sunset off Egmont Key in the Gulf of Mexico. I had to meet the Admiral in Key West on the 30th, so that meant about a 38-hour run from St. Pete. I motor sailed south all night along the Gulf Coast and finally lowered the main the next morning, since it wasn't bringing much to the party. At Marco Island, I topped off the fuel, got some chips and junk food at Rose Marina and kept on going. I was able to set the main and jib leaving Marco and left him up all night. Since we had a following wind, I didn't realize that it was getting pretty breezy until early morning on the 30th. Fortunately, I doused the sails and had a wet run down the Key West Northwest Channel just before dawn. 
finishing that 38-hour run of 222 nautical miles. After I got tied up with the much appreciated morning help of Corey at Galleon Marina, I caught a few winks before Tanya arrived. We had planned to leave direct for Havana on New Year's Eve, but the forecast was not great for the Gulf Stream. So we decided to hang out in Key West for New Year's, then stop at the Dry Tortugas and wait for a good window. The Galleon Marina was full the next day on New Year's Eve, so we spent New Year's at the fuel dock at Conk Harbor Marina, which was also full, so we paid the same crazy $5 per foot special event dock fee that we paid at Galleon the night before. Still, it's hard to beat New Year's in Key West, and we knew we wouldn't be paying any slip fees in the next few days. We had our champagne toast early and totally missed whatever was going on at midnight. On New Year's Day, just after dawn, we bid goodbye to family, friends, and the internet, and sailed, excuse me, motored, west to the Dry Tortugas. The Tortugas are about 60 miles west of Key West, maybe 70, and the main feature is Fort Jefferson on Garden Key. It's a huge fort, some 47 acres, and built in 1847, made out of 16 million bricks, give or take. It has seen very little action as a fort, and is mainly known as the place where Dr. Samuel Mudd was imprisoned for tending to the medical needs of one John Wilkes Booth, the assassin of Abraham Lincoln. The water in the Tortugas is as beautiful as the rest of the Keys, and since it is a national park, there's wildlife galore. There are lots of pelicans at the fort. Tanya spotted a grouper under the boat so large I had to convince her it wasn't a shark. There are only two ways to get to the Dry Tortugas if you don't have your own boat. Either take the ferry from Key West or come by seaplane. The seaplanes are pretty cool, taking off and landing right next to the anchorage, or in some cases right through it. The dry tortugas are called dry because there is no fresh water to be found anywhere within the 101 square miles of Dry Tortugas National Park. There is no food or drink available once the ferry leaves each day. There is no Wi-Fi and no cellular service. Once we got a few miles from Key West, we were off the grid until we got to Cuba, and just barely on the grid once we got there. Fortunately for our family and friends, we carry a spot messenger, so a few select folks can follow our exact location track updated every 10 minutes, and we can also post manual position updates that show up on our JC Sales Facebook page. There was one major issue we had to contend with. The dinghy hadn't been brought out and inflated in a good year, and it turns out it had a leak, so we didn't have a way to get ashore. Fortunately, the park rangers were very kind and let us tie up in the only remaining space behind the ferry for a couple of hours at a time. They even found us some repair materials and updated us on the forecast. Another sailboat also donated some potential patching material to try and make the dinghy buoyant again. Unfortunately, the patch didn't hold, and we realized that the only way we'd be getting off the boat this trip was onto a dock or into the water. But meanwhile, Tanya was able to get in some quality time on Garden Key. As we checked in with the rangers on the morning of January 3rd, we saw from PassageWeather.com that our weather window had moved back to now. We saw that during the evening, the Florida Straits was showing white on the chart, which means the wave height was forecast to be less than half a meter. That's about as good as it gets, so bidding a quick adieu and thanks to the rangers, we shoved off around noon. We cruised by Loggerhead Key with its lighthouse and beautiful beach. Unfortunately, we couldn't stop at it and headed south, crossing the southern boundary of the park at mid-afternoon. A few minutes later, we reached the furthest point south that J.C. Sales has ever been, and by 4.30, we reached the deepest point 
that JC Sales has ever been. Now, the continental shelf on the Gulf Coast where I usually cruise is very shallow and extends out a good way. So the deepest point I'd been before was around 200 feet. The Florida Straits are another matter. At the deepest point, you are sailing with well over a mile of water below you. As it turns out, though, the crossing south was a milk run. I swear it was smoother in the Gulf Stream than at either side. Leaving the Tortugas, we had three to five foot swells, which was no big deal since they were longer. And I mentioned to Tanya how different they were than the short chop on the Gulf Coast. We missed seeing the legendary purple water in the Gulf Stream since we crossed the axis in the middle of the night, but we could live with that. Near dawn, I pushed the throttle down a little until we were back up to 6.5 knots with no sail up. I'd be damned if we were going to be the last of three boats into customs and into a slip. We galloped into the buoy and then eased off as we navigated the channel, which you do not want to stray from. As we turned to port, we met with a beautiful sight. Sunrise over palm trees, a pretty little cove, and the customs dock to port, right where it was supposed to be. Marina Hemingway is actually a few miles west of Havana Harbor, which is pretty much reserved for cruise ship and commercial traffic. The boat slips at Marina Hemingway are comprised of four canals, each about a half mile long. We were on Canal 1, nearest the water, and there were maybe 15 boats tied up on the south side of the canal and none on the ocean side. The rest of the canal was empty, except for a couple of unfortunate vessels at the east end that had seen better days. Just a couple of hundred feet west of us was the 24-hour snack bar, which actually had coffee, rum, water, soda, cigarettes, bathroom, showers, and laundry. The Admiral and I went and got a couple of espressos every morning for one cook each, which is somewhere around a dollar or a dollar and a quarter if my math is right, and depending on how you change your money. I'll have some critical info about bathrooms and money in part two, but for now, I'll spare you the details. When people ask how the food was in Cuba, the first thing I have to mention is that we ate Chinese food and pizza pretty often, followed next most often by Cuban sandwiches at the Yacht Club and ham and eggs for breakfast at the little cafe on the east end of the marina. Obviously, none of these were serious local cuisine. We did eat about half a dozen times at local paladares, which are private houses turned into restaurants. And we ate lunch twice at El Templete on the Malecon, overlooking Havana Harbor, which is pretty much a tourist area, and thus pretty nice. I got gin and tangare at El Templete, and the Admiral enjoyed the croquetas so much we had to come back for a second time. We enjoyed the Paladares a lot, from fancy exclusive ones in Havana and Playa that our special contact got us into, to more regular joints in Jaimenitas, Santa Fe, and in the countryside in Pinar del Rio. I know it sounds crazy that Marina Hemingway would have a Chinese restaurant on the property, but that's exactly where we had our first lunch. On the second floor, overlooking the entrance channel, it's a great place to catch some rays and chill out. Some of the English translations of Chinese dishes in a Spanish-speaking country were pretty interesting, though. I did not try the fish to the vapor with garlic, but I assume it means steamed. People have been asking me, what's it like down there in the land of Castro? Are the cars all really those old Chevys? There's so much to say, but the phrase that came to mind was good intentions. People listlessly sweeping a weedy track at a school stadium that I never saw in use. Tennis courts at the marina with no nets, allegedly installed for Obama's visit. A big blank space that looked ready to be an outdoor basketball court or something. 
but contained simply a giant wooden chair that I couldn't resist sitting in. The basic wage provided by the state isn't enough to get by on, so everyone has to hustle. The folks running their own legit or black market businesses are friendly, ambitious, and eager to please. The folks working at their state wage jobs, understandably, are less enthusiastic. We found the Cuban people to be very warm and friendly, resilient, and good-spirited despite years of privation. There's a saying there, you can get almost anything done if you have the materials. But there's the rub. Yes, there are a lot of Chevys, Fords, Packards, and the like from 1940s to around 59 or something, I guess. The crazy thing is that every single one I rode in or saw up close had been converted to diesel. There are also Russian Ladas from the 70s and 80s, some newer Chinese Geelys, and a few more common species for party officials or tourist rentals. The climate was amazing as advertised, though. In January, the average temperatures are a high of 79 degrees Fahrenheit and a low of 61. With a northern front, it can get a little more on the chilly side, which happened during our stay. And more importantly, it gets especially breezy during the northers, and you do not want to be out in the Gulf Stream then. But it was still kind of fun to see Atlanta expecting snow while we were wearing shorts. We're only getting warmed up here as well, but speaking of ninjas, we're about out of time for this episode. But before you go, I just wanted to sincerely thank you for listening. And if you made it this far, I'd like to ask you one favor. Please hit the subscribe button if you're not already subscribed. If you're on iTunes, you probably know what to do. If you're on the website, there should be a big red button, or you can go to the multimedianinja.com forward slash subscribe. And if you're on YouTube, you should see a little thingy here at the end you can just click on. Join us next time for info on the very cool Hemingway International Yacht Club, the Hemingway House at Finca Vigia, and the countryside of Pinar del Rio. And for some critical info you need to know about toilet paper, money, and of course, cigars. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the Multimedia Ninja mailing list by going to the themultimedianinja.com and you'll see the subscribe thing. Scroll down to the bottom if you don't see it. It'll pop up or jump around or you'll see something in bright, bold red. You can also subscribe to the audio podcast on iTunes and have it waiting for you every week. And you can subscribe to the video version of the podcast on the Multimedia Ninja YouTube channel. Just click on the little thingy at the end of this video if you're watching video. And please give us a thumbs up and a nice comment on this episode if you would be so kind. I always appreciate your feedback and support. With that, I'm going to get on to part two and I'll see you next time.